Uh, Brida Murphy of the Tune Mother and Baby Home Alliance. Hello, uh, Brida. Hi, John. How are you? And again, uh, I'm going to get the name right. Uh, the Union, Union Duffy. <laughs> uh, sorry, Union. Uh, adoptee and activist. Uh, Un Union Duffy. Uh, have I got that right? <laughs> It's Union, Union, yes. Union, Union. I'm terribly sorry. If, 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 like, like Eugene, like Eugene at the start. <laughs> Union. Yeah. Union, yes. Uh, Union, okay. <laughs> and uh, a very special guest is Maureen Considine, uh, who's a visual artist and um, historian. Uh, hello, Maureen. Hi. Uh, I'll just give you, uh, just speak a, a little bit about you. Uh, um, Maureen has been researching residential institution grave, institutions graves since 2013 uh, with uh, Catherine Coffey O'Brien, uh, who's a survivor of the Mother and Baby Homes. She founded the Cork uh, Survivors and Supporters Alliance. Um, Maureen, you're a PhD candidate working on memory and mourning through art history. And uh, what we're going to talk about today is uh, Besborough Mother and Baby Home which is in Blackrock uh, County Cork, or was in Blackrock County Cork. And it is believed, and this is, this is from a report that came out during the commission, that they believe there are um, 800 yes. plus dead. That's right, John, the commission's, yeah, uh, for the commission's figure for Besborough is around 900. That's, that's 900 that they found documentation for. And sadly, um, we have a history in Ireland of not recording stillborn children. Um, so they won't be included in the numbers. Um, so we, we are talking about in excess of 900. And if you connect it to the county home, then in excess of 1,500. Um, so, so it's, it's, it's quite a big death toll um, and the commission was able to identify the burial place of some of the children because some were buried in a local cemetery because they had died in the hospital. So the body was transferred from the hospital to the local cemetery and um, they were the ones they were mostly able to identify. Um, all the rest remain missing and we're in a situation here where the nuns don't know where a minimum of 840 bodies are, and, uh, and that's a conservative estimate. Okay, and um, they, they discovered this, and since then there's been no uh, search for these bodies in terms of, you know, um, like in Bosnia they found, you know, they just they discovered the bodies in Trebinica. I mean, is there no machinery or anything available to, to discover this? So the commission did do a geophysical test of the area that the nuns had identified to some returning survivors as where their baby was buried. And what they found was that the nuns had been lying all those years to those yeah. mothers. Those babies were not buried there. And um, we always suspected it was a lie because the area they talked about was called an angel's plot. And it was very, very small. It was like, um, it's like a bay window in a big house. That's the kind of space it took up. So it wasn't possible that that many bodies would be in there. And the other issue was it was within the nuns' own cemetery and all um, religious orders that we're aware of have a practice of never burying the religious with the dead that they would, would see as contaminating. Yes. So they would, they would see legitimate babies as, as a contaminating element. So they would never, ever bury them in their own cemetery. So um, I see you have the map up there on the screen and the word ruin there right in the center of the circle, that's the castle folly. It's a 19th century fake castle and the nun's own graveyard is at the base of that. And that's where they told people um, the, that their babies were buried. But we've since found out that they're not buried in, in amongst the ruins at all. They're actually buried to the northwest of the Castle Folly, where you see those words, children's burial ground. And this was huge for us because there was no maps. The commission couldn't identify any maps that properly identified the children's burial ground. The commission with all its researchers and all its powers weren't able to find this particular map. And we went hunting for it and we got some legal support as well. And between um, 
I suppose, my constant emails and phone calls asking Ordnance Survey Ireland if they found anything and the follow up from our legal team. This was unearthed in the Ordnance Survey Ireland archive. There's actually tracing paper, you know, like um, when we're all at home making our banana bread at the moment. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the best way to explain it to people. So what, what the map maker would have done, he would have been a soldier in, in the Irish Defence Forces. He would have traced, um, using this tracing paper, he would have traced the original map, which was at a scale of 25 inches to one mile. So it's, it's incredibly detailed. If you're just for one square mile, you're looking at a 25 square inch piece of paper. Um, so the accuracy is really... Um, something you can rely on and I've actually checked it and I've layered it over other maps and that folly is bang on every time I measure it against another accurate map it is exactly where this guy but, drew it back in the day. But there's no, there's no, the bodies aren't there I mean that's where the nuns bury, the, bury each other is it? And the folly, is it? So within that circle of the ruin, that's where the nuns buried themselves, their, their own people. Um, uh, so that ruin actually has a wall around it. So the nuns kind of walled off their own cemetery. Um, but this children's burial ground area is outside of that wall. And um, it's hard to kind of convey how big this is, but this is, this is a really big landscape. Um, so if the castle folly is like, a very small kind of cottage house, but it's two stories, then you have, what you have to imagine is that the circle around it is about three times the size of it. And then the circle around children's burial ground, which is to the Northwest, again, another three times the size of it. So we're talking about a really massive area of landscape. Um, and and this is the thing, the, the map maker, the, the man making the map, um, recorded at such a level of detail that when you zoom in on the map, you can see things like he's marked the shrubs and the trees and the height uh, of them. Yeah, fir tree there is. Yeah, he marked fir tree medium and an oak tree large and things like that. Mm, he's yeah. marked his footpaths, which no longer exist. He's marked that colour pond up there in the, um, so it's straight out from the folly towards the railway line. There's, there's a colour pond out here. Oh, oh yeah, um, pond, I see it, yeah, just here. Yeah. That's still there. Um, I brought an archaeologist out there and he, he said, this is a man-made structure, find out what this is. And we, when we got the map, we realised it was a colour pond. It's covered over, but, yeah. but it is still there. Yeah. And where, do, where, where, where have you, do you have any feeling yourself where these the bodies might be? I mean... Uh, yeah, we do. So um, as well as this map being considered highly accurate, the kind of thing that um, you could use in court over a land dispute, um, right. uh, it would have gone through seven layers of checking in the army reporting system. And we actually have the dates that they were there in December of 1949 and January of 1950. They even record that one of the days was wet, so they didn't do much work that day. Um, they, we have their names and um, all of those different colours on the map indicate uh, different levels of checking and the big blue tick indicates it went through the final level of checking. Okay. So we knew what they were involved in was a serious business and they made sure to, to um, accurately record it. And then it was checked by their supervisor who also visited Besborough. And he, he would have been docked a day's pay if he had gotten something wrong. It was a very strict system they had, yeah. um, to the inch. Like. So as well as that, when we released this map evidence to the, the wider survivor community, um, a woman named Anna Harmon, who we worked with for, for quite a long time, she's our friend, um, and Anne's baby, Evelyn, died in Besborough. And Anne has been our motivating factor for Besborough. And um, it's, about, it's about finding Evelyn's grave for Anne, really, and, and all the other women who came to us after they heard we were helping Anne. And um, when weren't Anne they, saw... Weren't they buried under their house names? Um, well... Sorry, I, I hope I didn't mean to no, There's no grave marker, so they weren't buried under any name. Um, I, I see, but um, like... Uh, didn't you find a, a, a grave in St. Joseph's Cemetery? Oh, yeah. 
the women, the women who died in Besbra, some of them had given 30, 40, 50 years service uh, free labour after um, having their babies. They're, they were buried in an unmarked grave in a local cemetery, um, 14 of them. And two of them are named on the grave, but one of them is named with her house name. And her mm-hmm. house name was Doris and her real name was Anne. And they had right. attendance, things like that. Yeah, and it's back to issues of uh, worthiness, the nuns deciding who's worthy and who isn't worthy. And um, Doris was 85 when she died. They had had her since she was a young woman. And um, she was their property. She was their slave and she wasn't paid. She wasn't allowed to leave. And when she died, they must have had some level of affection or fondness to her, for her to mark her grave at all. Um, right. but, they put, but they put Doris on it. They didn't put Anne on it, you know? Right. Well, yeah. So, okay, Maureen, sorry, go on. Continue on that. I, I interrupted you there, please. No problem. So Anne O'Gorman, um, she she saw the map in this this we did a video and we put the video on the internet so the women could see it and and um, got up the next day and decided she was coming down to Cork from Limerick and um, she was actually at the bus stop in Limerick and she met a woman named Phil or Philly and Phil and Anne had been in Besborough together in the seventies and they remembered each other and and told Phil what she was doing. And she said, I'm going down to Bedsbury now to check it because these girls found this map and I, and I want to go and um, be with my Evelyn. And Philly said, I'll go with you. And they went together to Bedsbury and they met Catherine there. And Catherine is, I suppose, like I call her our, our survivor rep because she, um, the women ring her. They trust her, they ring her, they know she was in the same place as them and they know what they know she went through the same things. So um they they all met out at Besborough and they decided to do a video for the general public. And what came out in the video was Philly wanted to tell people for the first time, um, she told the commission, but she wanted to tell the public that she was at the burial of a baby in Besborough in the 1970s. And it was in the area that we're talking about. And um, she remembered coming through the black gates and um, and down the path a bit. And she remembered that the girl whose baby died had special, the girl had special needs, not the baby, but the girl had, was, was disabled. She was um, intellectually disabled. And... Um, Philly was always very sad about it and remembered it for a long time. She remembered the baby and the girl and always wondered what happened to her. And they learned from other women that that poor girl had been into Besborough more than once. And um, they, um, so they stood at this burial ground uh, together in this video, the three women hanging on to each other and talking about what they remembered. And it... It, it's absolutely shattering to watch. It's up on our Twitter, the last 900 of Esbra, if anyone wants to look at it. But it, it, taught, it, it taught me something um, or, it, or it gave me something for my heart, which is this is why I do this. And there are some very hard days with this. But when I saw that video, it made everything worth it. Um, it absolutely everything worth it. And I'm so proud to have helped in some way. Um, so then between Anne and Philly and the map, we feel that all of these things add together to um, to indicate we're in the right area for children's burial ground. And Anne also remembers her baby being, well, she remembers men walking out in that direction with a box um, after her baby had died. So that's a third witness, that's a second witness. And then when Catherine was there, um, one of the older women could have been could have been um, the woman who's buried under the house named Doris. Um, she remembers this elderly lady working in the institution, saying to her, "I don't want you walking down there." And what she means is that path towards the folly. And she said, "Those that are carrying the living should never walk with the dead." So that's our third piece of evidence. Um, but 
the map evidence is very strong on its own, but it's great to have it backed up by the memories of the women um, yeah. because it's another layer of confidence in the map, you know? Yeah, uh, but more in, um, is there any way that, that, I mean, you say that they did just do physical surveys, but uh, is there any way you can know for sure? I think, like, basically, um, I think people do know. Yeah. I mean, this, this map was uncovered. Um, yes. I, th I think there are plenty of people within the civil service who have information that they have some, some who have covered it up, but others who have actually sat on it and waited for the right person to come looking for it and the right opportunity to reveal it. So, yeah. you know, the time, the time has long come and the commission is there to be contacted. Um, they're, they're pretty much, their work is pretty much complete, but, um, if anyone had any other information, they could of course come to us or um, or take it to the media, whatever no. they whatever they like. No. But yeah, no, rather than, yeah, sorry, Mar Maureen, rather rather than that, though they've in their wisdom, Cork City Council of of are considering a, a, a planning application for a housing development there. Yeah, adjacent to the to the this ground. So. Way back in 2014, our, we had a new Cork City development plan and um, every, every town and um, county council, city council has them. And they're, they sort of plan out what's going to happen in the next five to 10 years in an area. And in the Cork City development plan, they earmarked the area um, out around the Castle Folly for um, residential development. Right. And there's there's a map there that has um, some circles on it, and the circles indicate um, where they where they thought was a good development opportunity. Right. Um, I might not give sorry, I might not have given you that map. Um, okay. If you do, yes, that one. Right. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Second. This one. So yeah, so somebody within the city council decided that it would be a good idea to build houses in in these areas where these orange circles are. Um, and the difficulty we have is that that second from the bottom orange circle is the location of the children's burial ground as per the map evidence. Now, there is a fence built across the middle of it and the nuns claim to remember, to, to have no recollection of any burials and have no idea where, where the children are buried. Maybe when they built that fence, they had some knowledge of burials. I don't know because they're not being honest. Um, they're not being forthcoming. They're not sharing the information. Um, but also, I'm not sure I trust their memory because the home was open since 1922. So there aren't going to be women there who remember that. There aren't going to be nuns who remember whether they tell the truth or not, they're not going to remember burials as far back as the 40s. Um, and we think the burials started in Bellsborough in and around the 40s. Isn't there a nun that was there for 50, 50 years and still alive? Um, Am I probably. Um, I, you'd have to ask Catherine. She'd be ex the expert on that. I know the main Actually, Brita, Brita mentioned it. But you, it was in your notes, Brita, to me, um, that a nun had been there for 50 years and, or at least... They, they don't know what happened. They, they, th those who were there don't know or, or have yeah. no recollection. One who was there for a 30 year period and she claims uh, to not, our Frida might actually have better notes, but she claims to not remember any burials and she was at them, you know, like, like Philly will tell you which nuns were at the burial the, of the baby she was at. So, you know, they were at the burials and, um, you know, we 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 been in the face waiting for the nuns to come out and tell the truth. To be honest, so you know, it is what it is. Brida and uh, Union, uh, Union, I'd like to take you both in, bring you both into this because um, give Maureen a, a rest. Thank you very much, Maureen. The, the the research is amazing, and it's great when you find something like that map. I mean, it just it unlocks a lot of a lot of the questions. That's fantastic research. It was amazing for us, and it it. it it brought us somewhere we hadn't expected, so we had to accept it too. It was a bit of a shock, but yeah. you know, when you're looking for the truth, you go where it takes you. Yeah, you know? I mean, I suppose like Catherine Cordes in um, in in in, in Tume. Uh, Brida, um, and, uh, Union is a, is um, an adoptee 
from the Marion Vale mother and baby home in Newry, County Town Union, th there's a development being planned for there as well. That's right. Uh, there was a, a planning application put in for a Maxwell services station um, a few years ago, and it was granted permission in 2019. Um, I I objected to it, um, obviously on the grounds that um, the the grounds themselves of the former institution, the mother and baby institution, the Magdalen Andre, the refuge, the hostel, the training centre, all of these facilities all run on the same site. Basically, had had never been. Um, robustly and comprehensively investigated um, and, and, and until something like that was done um, we didn't wish anything to be done with these grounds um, because a bit like Maureen um, and, and Bessborough um, and a number of other institutions all around Ireland you know what I mean there's um, a number of planning um, approvals have been given developments have taken place on, on the grounds of former institutions without any um, you know recourse to what has happened uh, previously and historically, and, and especially when you look into the fact that, as, as Maureen has alluded to, and Breda will as well, that there's large numbers, extensive numbers of uh, disappearances, of unmarked graves, of um, where we don't know where the remains of, of women and children are buried. And, and it's also adult women that we're talking about in a large number of cases here as well. So it's not, it's not even just children. Um, unbap unbaptized babies or, or um, stillbirths, you know what I mean? You're talking about adult women that were that died in a lot of these institutions under various circumstances and, and were buried in graves, sometimes in mass graves, and um, sometimes without um, you know any kind of market at all. And then in the cases that, that Moines told you about, you know, about, they were buried on, under their house names as well, which obviously um, will tell you that the nuns had absolutely, you know, give no dignity to these people in life nor death. And of course, being buried, um, anybody that is marked, in, marked or buried in, in a marked grave under their house name will obviously make it extremely difficult for anyone to try and trace that person as well because you're effectively looking for a false name. Um, and Marion Vale and Yuri is exactly the same. Obviously, there, there are major anomalies around the grounds on the Marion Vale grounds themselves, um, uh, which was handed over to uh, a rehab, uh, rehabilitation unit in 1984. Um, and this again makes it very, very difficult because um, the former grounds of these institutions um, in many cases have been taken on as different sorts of ventures by these religious congregations, uh, you know, in, in different different guises. Um, and somewhat ironically and paradoxically in a lot of cases, you know what I mean, where they're actually um, running residential institutions as care homes, elderly homes. Um, when, when you look at the treatment um, that was that was made out to the people that were in these institutions. Um, um, so these are again issues, you know what I mean, that we need, we're looking at up and down the length and breadth, um, east to west and north to south in this country, you know what I mean, because there's no grounds of any institution that wouldn't throw, throw up major problems and a, a lot of questions that need to be answered. Um, and, and Yuri, as I say, there's a actual service station that's went ahead. Um, part of the offence and the insult within that would be the fact that they want to uh, integrate a kid's play park in that. So given the history of the institution and, and on the grounds, I mean, we, we find that obviously very offensive and very insulting. And luckily enough, if you would describe it as that, we, we have got an archaeological caveat inserted that um, a survey will be done um, before any commencement of any planned development on the grounds, John, you know. You don't have that same proviso, do you, Maureen? Re regarding the de any developments that um, are... Yeah. We, we, we don't have any conditions yet because it's just going through that stage and the developers refuse to do a consultation with us. But, um, you know, for yeah, all... Yeah, sorry, uh, they've, re they've refused to talk to you about... about we, we, offered, we offered several times through the Cork City Council to meet with them and have a conversation with them about um, what might be possible. Um, because we were, we were only ever interested in protecting the children's burial ground. Um, yeah. It didn't have to be this way. It really didn't. Uh, they made their choice, you know. Um, because Bessborough is a 200 acre landscape, it, it, it was possible for them, for someone to build somewhere 
at Bessborough, but just not in that location um, and not overlooking that location. I would say as well that we've experienced the same thing as uh, Unan because um, the site that Bessborough is on, it's, it's a 200 acre landscape, but the central part of it, the buildings where the women would have lived and give, given birth, um, they're still in use as a as legacy services related to what a mother and baby home was. Um, so there's an adoption agency there. There's a family, there's a, there's, it's called Besborough Family Centre Limited. And it's a company limited by guarantee that has the nuns um, on its board. They might still be on its board. They definitely were the last time I checked. Um, and they're involved in people's lives, in families' lives and in separating families from one another. And while um, just like everybody else, I want to keep children safe. And I, and I would, of course, agree with the children being removed from an unsafe environment. In Cork, we have a disproportionately high amount of family separations in comparison to Dublin. And you have to wonder why that is. Why, why are so many children being taken away in Cork when, when the goal is certainly to try and keep families together in the best interests of the child mm -hmm. as long as they're safe. So it is worrying, but at the same time, we try to leave them to it and not interfere with their work because again, you know, no one wants to interfere in the in the healthcare needs of vulnerable people. Um, but the the building there you see just before the cluster of trees is the old maternity building and it faces the children's burial ground. So it's very difficult to avoid each other. Sure. Yeah. But there, you know, and we're trespassing when we go out there. Or every time we yeah. sorry, go on the please. Oh, I just said every time we, we visit, we're trespassing. We trespass when we go out there. We're not meant to be there. It's not a public burial ground. It is a, it is private land and being there is a matter of it's fine now. They've gotten used to us and, and there's a new manager of the family centre and he seems to be very happy to accommodate us. But we've had encounters with men screaming into our face out there. We've been told we're trespassing. I had the gates locked with my car inside it. I had to call the guards to get it to, to be right. released. Um, <laughs> You know, and, and Union could tell you some stories now that'll bring it to the next level. But, um, <laughs> Actually, but, yeah, Maureen, um, I, 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 we're, 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 yeah. we've got about five minutes left. I just want to go to Breda because, I mean, Breda, this, these are stories of familiar up in Tume as well. I imagine some of those, um, that sort of confrontation, that conflict between, you know, people who don't, the, people who don't want the, the secrets out. Sorry. Um, there hasn't been confrontation as such in Tume, to be honest. We ourselves have found good support there. But one thing I would say about the sites throughout is that when we look at, for instance, Donnybrook and the Magdalene home there, when the site was being developed and the remains of the women were being exhumed, they found that they had another 22 uh, women sets of remains. So where the sisters had reported 133 uh, deceased Magdalene women, there were actually 155. Um, now the sad part of that is that those women, uh, the nuns themselves, could not provide any identity to. And where they wanted um, the developer and um, the local authority in themselves, they wanted the remains of the women to be buried um, in mass graves, like three to four sets of remains in one coffin. Um, that wasn't allowed by the local authority, thankfully. But the sisters then went and um, ensured that the remains were cremated and they were reinterred afterwards into a cemetery. But for me, the cremation rules out the possibility of any identity being afforded to these women in their death. It has taken, you know, it has taken their life uh, right throughout while they were in service and servitude to the sisters. And then ultimately it takes their, their, um, their opportunity to be reunited with the family. And it's not just, you know, applicable to Tume or to 
the identity, the taking, the forced separation um, is, a, is a big, big issue. Um, and in, in Letter of Prack, um, a man came, an elderly gentleman came in 2002 and located the remains and the whereabouts of his friend he played with when the boy was only four in 1935. Mm. And he had been playing one day and, and died the next, and buried the next day rather. So he was outside of the, the grounds where uh, the burials were taking place. So, you know, it's Joseph Pike is another one. It is really disturbing to me and to, to most people to hear these stories that, you know, our own citizens are neglected not alone by the religious order who, whose whole remit was to care for them and who were being paid to do so by the exchequer, but by the state also. The state has not done its work to ensure that the lives of these children and women and anyone who's deceased from the institution, that they are afforded the dignity in death that they should be. So it's like what we are, not allowed to remember them. Um, Maureen has said she's not allowed to go there with the mothers of the children. They're okay. not allowed to visit. It's, it's absolutely criminal. Thank you so much. Brilliantly um, put. Uh, Maureen, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, so very sorry about uh, the, the, the lack of time. Brida, um, when is the decision, Maureen, by the way, from Board Planola on that land? The oh. deadline for the deadline for objections is the same week the Commission's report is due. So it's the 12th of January. Yeah. The week um, the 11th, yeah. It can't be late because they won't accept them. So, uh, yeah, it's the 12th of January and um, another month then before they make a decision. Um, Thank you. In cases, yeah. Thank you, Maureen. Maureen Considine, uh, Breda Murphy. Union Duffy, <laughs> uh, thank you so much. And we're going to be back next week with another tune, uh, another special on the mother and baby homes. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, John. Thank you. Thank you, Union. Thank Bye -bye. you, Maureen. Thank you, Brita. Thanks a lot.